I'm going to ask my friend who is here, Dewan Cannon, if you could stand. Where are you, Dewan? Hello. Dewan, I want you all to note Dewan Cannon, um, in the earlier um, part of our service, we were commissioning new Stephen leaders. Dewan is recommissioned. Uh, Dewan, we have done that part, but I have a verse just for you and for your heart that we have prepared for this moment. So receive this blessing. This blessing to you come to others so that they and you may grow in his wholeness. Amen. Thank you. And we clap for everybody else. We clap for everybody else. I was asked a great question after last week's sermon, what is the social gospel? And some of you received my 1400 word answer in first reflections. Uh, some of you didn't make it through, I, I guess maybe some of you didn't open it, but I'll just simply say the most important thing to know about the social gospel is this, that it was the moment at which Washington Gladden and then joined by others determined that Salvation is never for the person alone, for the individual alone. It is always for the salvation of society and the transformation of society. So therein is the nugget, the seed of the social gospel. And we begin this series, you need to know that, right? So that's important to know. The other thing uh, that I want to lift up is that last week I talked about three things as formative uh, guidelines for the social gospel. One is to know the climate or the context of the passage and the times that we're in, to know the text that we're in, and then to ground everything that we do in the relationships that we have. And so with that in mind, let us turn now to this time. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock, and our salvation. Amen. Our passage from Matthew 15, beginning in verse 10, has many implications for understanding the social gospel. We find Jesus calling the crowd to him and immediately changing the way they listened and the way they understood how they were to live in the times that they were in. As they were struggling for their very existence, Jesus changed the script. Through his teachings and examples, he was flipping the script on what had been previously taught, which was in the scriptures. It's not that he was teaching something that was outside the scriptures, but he changed it. In a time with strict dietary laws for Jews, Jesus was teaching a radical concept that it did not matter what went into their mouths and defining who they were as children of God. That did not matter what they ate as they were defined as children of God. The only thing that mattered is what came out of their mouths, right? For starving people who are constantly scandalized by those who have rules and regulations and say you can do this and you can't do that, this is a radical interpretation. Certain foods couldn't be eaten. This is liberating good news. Jesus wants to clear the air and the intestinal tract with his witness. However, the flip of the script happens to Jesus in the next section. In Matthew 15, 21, having just taught that strict obedience to the law is less important than the attitude of the heart, Jesus meets his match. We had a sign in the preaching room at Yale, the homiletics room at Yale Divinity School. It read, preach what you practice. Jesus, are you listening? And are you understanding? I know that sounds heretical to ask that question of him, but I have to, and you're asking the same question too. There, alone in non-Jewish territory, the district of Tyre and Sidon, Jesus encounters a Canaanite woman. He has gone there to get away from the crowd. He's gone there to rest. But in this region called nowhere in the text, he doesn't find rest at all. He finds confrontation and challenge. He has stepped into a place of tension and prejudice. It is where the bitterest enemies of the Jews reside. It is also where Jesus meets his match. 
As Matthew 15, 21 opens, Jesus seems surprisingly ethnocentric as he is besieged by a relentless foreign woman who has no names, no name, a woman with two major cultural and religious strikes against her. The temptation for a preacher here is to wriggle out of the confrontation and paint Jesus in a much better light. It would probably bode well for the preacher if that happened, but it's not going to happen. Sorry, Jesus. The disciples don't help at all, right? They show up and they yell, send her away. Those are the exact words they used in Matthew 14 when they met thousands of people who were hungry. Remember that? And Jesus stopped them in their tracks at that point and says, you don't send them away, you feed them, right? You meet them where they are and you feed them. In that instance, he challenged the disciples to give everything they had to the poor and to the people. Now, instead of being swayed by this foreign woman's needs, Jesus contends that only Israelites figure among the sheep that he shepherds. Ouch! It is as if the woman's plea was a temptation, an attempt to divert him from, his, from the mission of his own kind, to, a mission to his own kind, excuse me. While that may have satisfied the disciples who had arrived on the scene and were now listening, the woman's unyielding love for her daughter impels her to, her to kneel before him and continue her appeal and her begging for help. He dismissed her with what was probably a common cultural insult. Dogs don't get to eat at our table. Now he's working with two strikes. This does nothing to dissuade this intrepid woman with a mischievous reminder that dogs are far cleverer than sheep, which we all would agree with, she turns the slight inside out as she says that she could content herself with scraps if he could find the generosity of his heart to share them. That gets to Jesus. He doesn't strike out. She touches his heart and she turns his heart through the immensity of her faith. I want to remind you that the confrontation of women with Jesus happens in other places in the scripture and every single time Jesus turns, every single time when they bring to him what it is that is deep in their hearts, mostly their needs for their loved ones, and in this case, the love of her daughter, he changes his heart. She calls him to preach what he practices. She turns Jesus' words on Jesus. With the same desperate insistence as the woman who snatched a healing touch of his cloak in Matthew 9, and with the unrelenting widow of Luke 18, this nameless woman demonstrates prophetic faith. As someone Isaiah might have called a foreigner who joined herself to the Lord, she pushes Jesus and his disciples to accept and embrace the distinctions that gender and nationality don't mean a thing. She calls them to remember that God's creation has no borders, that humanity knows no nationality. In effect, she calls Jesus to act like the Good Samaritan. Ouch! She calls Jesus to act like the Good Samaritan, the thing he claims the heart of his heart. And what happens next shows how Jesus can change. And that's the key to this passage. He grants her what she needs and heals her daughter instantly because it is her faith, which is not a Jewish faith, that is so powerful and so true, he changes in the moment. The power of these texts is almost too obvious to mention, but I'm a preacher and we always mention the obvious. So how do we identify ourselves in relation to others, right? How do we identify ourselves in relation to others? That's a question. Do we see the world in terms of clear divisions or do we see the world as a process of growing unity? Where are the boundaries of our sense of solidarity? How does our membership in the body of Christ condition our relationships? Whose burden is also our own? Who 
is calling us to enlarge our perception and our participation as members in the body of Christ today? Beyond all of these borderline and boundary issues, we might just ask if Jesus himself needed, needed a persistent stranger to call him beyond his limited viewpoint, perhaps we also need such a call beyond our limited viewpoints? Here is the lead into the answer. We begin by seeing and listening to people with two strikes or more against them. They, more than any others, can remind us that as human beings we share one and the same birthright, one and the same vocation, that we are loved by God and that we are God's chosen ones and we love one another in that context. We do not have to look too far. People with two strikes against them are just outside our doors and they're all around us in the state of Ohio, where we rank 32nd out of 50 states in rates of poverty. That's terrible. This past year, 1,683,890 Ohioans reported, reported income below the poverty level, and that doesn't even count those who didn't report in. We stand at 14.9% of poverty, which is 5% higher than the national average. Like the woman pleading for her daughter to be healed, we have nine Ohio cities where more than half the children live in poverty. One out of every two children in those places woke up this morning with no food and no hope of food. Here in Ohio, mothers are crying out like this mother was crying out for their children to be fed. In another 39 cities, the poverty rate for children is at least 30%. The highest child poverty rates are in Youngstown at 58%, East Cleveland at 57%. For overall poverty, the highest rates are in East Cleveland at 38.9% and Nelsonville at 36.5%. Living in poverty means that you have an income of no more than $25,465 for a family of four, two adults and two children in the household. For a single parent, it would be two children and $20,231 or less. Now Columbus ranks 48th in our state, which you think is good among all of the cities and towns in the state. But 20% of those who live within our boundaries and our borders as a city live in poverty. 30% of our children are living below the poverty level. Stunningly, you will hear and see rates in these small cities and towns, many of pla the places that we have come from or we have family in. Many of these places would shake us to the core. Warren, Fostoria, Cambridge, Cleveland, Trotwood, Nelsonville, Ashtabula, Campbell, Canton, all of these places have poverty rates where one out of every two children in their towns is living in poverty. Follow the eastern counties in a sad trek down the border with Pennsylvania, from the lake, down to the river and around to Cincinnati and beyond, and you will find swaths of poverty that are unmatched in most states. It is sad, it's very sad abject poverty just miles away. Our rural poor in Ohio are literally starving for food and for jobs. Poverty leaves a mother and a father and each one of their children hungry at the start of each day. A hungry body means a hungry mind and a desperate, impoverished mind, body, and spirit. A hungry mind and a hungry body desperate for nutrition and hope, is scary to every single person involved in their lives. If you have bullets but no bread, bad things can happen. If you have empty stomachs and an empty bank account or no bank account at all, hunger will drive you to desperate actions and desperate behaviors. We are the keepers 
of the social gospel. We are, you and I. We need to be the ones that right these wrongs. We cannot do this by ourselves. I don't believe that. And we can't do it unless we have relationships that really matter. Remember last week I offered this important guide on justice work and turning the tables on injustice. First, the work of justice is simply this. We have to figure out what belongs to whom and return it to those from whom it has been taken, including bread from their table and jobs for their lives and homes where they have a roof over their head. Figuring this out is not my work alone. It's also not the work of the Justice and Mercy Commission. And it's not the work of bread, although bread is very helpful with this. It's the work of all of us. And that, by the way, is why all of us are invited each and every September to house meetings with bread so we can come together and look at these things and be stronger together. We're invited into deeper relationships with one another to figure out what needs to be done to address poverty and injustice. And figuring this out is the work of all of us. God is calling no less than each one of us to do this. The no-name Canaanite woman from nowhere is representative of every man, woman, and child who has no name for us. They are faceless to us. They are unknown, and as a result, they are unrelated to us. But our calling is to find out who they are and to see their faces. We will find solutions to the problems we face, they face, when we have names for people and understand the people that we write off as the problem. In my book, The Genius of Justice, I tell the story of power. Some of you have heard this more than once, but I return to him before closing. On a late, chilly autumn evening, I met power at church. Unlike others who come late at night, Power's request as he approached me alone in the parking lot as I was getting to my car was quite different. He did not ask for money or any help of any kind. He just wanted me to call the police. He was sleeping under the shelter of our Broad Street entrance, next to the front doors, beneath the chiseled words, enter to worship, depart to serve. He asked if I could call the police to tell them that it was okay for him to sleep there because he was afraid he would be arrested if I didn't call. I agreed to call them. Although I offered him food and drink and offered to take him out to dinner, it was late, we could find some 24-hour place, couldn't we? He said no, he didn't need anything else, he didn't need a blanket, he just politely declined. Instead, he asked me what time he could return in the morning to begin working for the church. And being my limited brain, I thought, we don't have any job openings, right? <laughs> he said, I will be there. Just tell me what time to come. I said, how about 8 o'clock? Which, by the way, as all the staff knows, is long before the senior minister arrives. <laughs> so I said, how about 8 o'clock? At 8 o'clock, power showed up. That morning, he raked 22 bags of leaves in an hour and a half. When a member brought a pair of gloves for power to protect his hands from the coming cold, he returned them, encouraging the person to give them to someone who really needed them. Having been abused and even shot in the stomach by his cocaine-addicted father at 13, power was frightened. He hated to be touched, and he trusted very few people. In the weeks that followed, it became clear to me that even the floodlights and the shelter of our cathedral stone could not provide him what he needed. Yet he declined homeless shelters. He declined offers for housing that I brought to him. One night, carrying his graceful yet troubled life and his servant spirit with him, power disappeared onto the streets of Columbus. I have never seen him again. I think of him often. Bathed in the light, sheltered by God, in the shadows of our abolitionist congregation, power ministered in the heart of this city. Although the Mason's chisel had whittled in stone a command to worship and serve, I think we can all agree, and I'll speak for myself, I have fallen short of both worship and service too many times. Nevertheless, 
God has blessed us through the years with power and other men, women, and children like him who call us to ways of justice and mercy. When power first approached me, I did not see the man that he was. I did not receive him as a friend on the journey. I saw him for transactional purposes that I was assuming were about to happen. I braced for the ask without seeing the person standing right in front of me and even finding out who he really was. The essence of the man was lost to me at first. He was the one who broke the icy shield that I put up. He was the one who looked in my eyes. He was the one out of his brokenness that made a relationship happen. Too many of us do not know how to love how are we going to recover the ability to love ourselves and to love one another? I turn to the writings of Brother Thomas Merton. The reason why we hate one another or fear one another is that we secretly or openly hate and fear our own selves. And we hate ourselves because the depths of our being, or at the depths of our being, are, is a chaos of frustration and spiritual misery. Lonely and helpless, we cannot be at peace with others because we are not at peace with ourselves, and we cannot be at peace with ourselves because we are not at peace with God. To me, power is the other. He is the person in front of me whose name I do not know. Like power, the others sleep on the steps of our church tonight. They are frightened to go inside shelters and transitional housing. They are children who have dropped out of school, disappeared in the pandemic, and have never returned. They are women who work three jobs and still can't find a place to call home for their kids. They are nameless and faceless to too many of us, and yet their very presence in our lives and in our world should motivate each one of us each and every day to fight for justice. They must have names. Their faces must be seen and known. They must not be forgotten one more time, forsaken one more time. They are, in the words of Scripture, the poor who we have always with us. We will address the numbers of poverty when we know the names and faces of poverty. And as for the other real-life issues that I wrote into the sermon title today, you all know what they are. Just look around you. You'll figure it out you know the issues are not the issue. It's the people that are the issue. Issues arise from situations where people do not love themselves and do not love their neighbors and do, don't feel the love when it's actually there. So I ask you to honor the nameless Canaanite woman and her nameless daughter, to honor power. To do this, let's do this together. The list is long, but together we can move the needle every day. And let's move the needle every day through the power of God. Amen.